I find working my way through a new season of anime a little exhausting at times. It's not like I don't enjoy having so many new and potentially great shows to check out, but it usually takes me a few episodes before I really know how I feel about a show. And wading through the Keijos and Bloody Vores of this world can get a little tiring, to say the least. But then sometimes, you come across a show that makes sailing the ocean of mediocrity so worthwhile. A show so fresh and interesting that it completely revitalizes your interest in contemporary anime. And for me, the most recent example of this is Mob Psycho 100. Animated by Studio Bones and the second adaptation of One Punch Man author One, Mob Psycho tells the tale of Mob, a young boy born with insanely powerful psychic abilities. But rather than use his abilities to his advantage, Mob just wants to get in shape and lead a normal teenage life but of course is constantly tangled up in sinister cults, evil psychic rivals, and shadowy organizations hell-bent on world domination. But we have seen something pretty similar to this in last year's One Punch Man. They both have an insanely overpowered main character, an extremely likable secondary character, and both have an offbeat comedic tone. So that being the case, what is it about Mob Psycho that makes it so worthwhile? especially given that One Punch Man already exists and it's fantastic. Well friends, you've probably guessed by now, but that is exactly what we're here to discuss. So let's join up with the Body Improvement Club, bring our emotions to 100% as we talk about why you should watch Mob Psycho 100. One of the central themes of Mob Psycho is the idea of talent, or being considered an elite. And through the show's many characters, we see different ideas of what that actually means. Mob, for example, while having the potential psychic force of several nuclear weapons, doesn't really consider his power a useful skill in modern society, and so instead focuses his time on trying to become a more popular, well-rounded person, which ties into a major underlying theme of the show that self-improvement is more important than natural talents. And each antagonist that appears throughout the 12 episodes is in some way grappling with this idea of elitism through God-given ability or status. Take Hanazawa, for example. He's the first other psychic encountered by Mob and is nearly his total inverse. He uses his ability at every given opportunity in order to get ahead in life, and it's led to him being feared, popular and desired. But despite all this, deep down he suffers from the same fears as Mob, and that is that without his powers, he's nothing but an average, boring person. Mob's drive towards self-improvement is the major way the show establishes him as a likeable and endearing character. While he basically has the psychic potential to become God, he himself feels that this would be the easy way out. A false pretense that would elevate him in the eyes of others, but not count for any actual development on his part which actually kind of runs parallel to Saitama from One Punch Man. And for the first episode or two, similarities between the two seem pretty rampant. After all, they both have the same gormless expression, both have insanely powerful abilities, and both have a relatively simple outlook on life. But to me, the far more interesting conversation here isn't how the two are similar, but how they're different. I talked a lot in my One Punch Man video about how one of Saitama's greatest strengths was his mental fortitude, his ability to withstand large amounts of negativity and move forward regardless. And it's this key area where the two characters begin to differ. In fact, one even spoke about this in one of his interviews, saying that when writing Mob, he decided to write the character as emotionally weak and delicate in order to differentiate the two. The way this actually translates into the show is pretty clever. From a young age, Mob learned how dangerous his psychic abilities are, especially whenever his emotions go out of control. And in order to negate this, Mob has had to keep his emotions shackled. He doesn't really find humor in things and often misses out on common social cues. And this causes him to view the world with a simple innocence that honestly just makes him enduring as hell. The show pushes the concept further with a fun little plot mechanic. As Mob takes little pieces of emotional damage, we get a percentage mark. The more emotions that begin to bubble up inside him, the higher the percentage goes, maxing out at 100. Which usually, but not always, results in Mob letting his psychic abilities and emotions loose in one epic blast. It's a fun way to indicate how close we are to the next major plot points, but it's also a clever way to show us what Mob is feeling 
or more accurately, how strongly he's feeling it. Which is handy seeing as his facial expression is neutral 95% of the time. Making Mob so emotionally weak and delicate not only differentiates him from Saitama, but from pretty much every other shonen protagonist in existence. An indomitable spirit is basically a prerequisite for your average shonen hero. Even if they're initially weak or untalented, common practice states that the hero must be a pillar of inscrutable emotional strength and positivity, always saving the day with their inexhaustive drive to move forward. And Mob isn't like this, at all in fact. In the later half of the show we see him dragged into situations where despite his power, he's unwilling or unable to handle himself and must rely on the strength of others. Which may make him sound like a weak protagonist to some, but if anything it only frees his character of so many of the conventions that tie down your typical shonen hero and leads to some beautifully effective character moments in the final few episodes. About the only major character in the show not concerned with talent or being considered an elite seems to be the infinitely likeable Reagan, Mob's boss at his after school job at the Spirits and Such consultation office. Which is amusing, because despite claiming to be the greatest psychic of the modern era, he was born without any supernatural talent whatsoever. But despite this, he's consistently able to fool Mob and pretty much every other character in the show into believing that he is an ultra powerful ESP user. And he does this by relying on his one specific area of god given talent, his ability to manipulate others through sheer confidence and charisma. This is the kind of character I never get tired of seeing in fiction. The kind without any real standout physical or supernatural talents, but they've basically rolled a 10 in charisma and use it to survive in a world of monsters. Another great example being Izaya from Dorarara, a guy who's able to manipulate nearly every other character in the show purely by virtue that he understands how people tick and exactly what buttons to push in order to get what he wants. But while Izaya is more of a calculating genius, Reagan is much more a fly by the seat of his pants kind of guy. And much of the comedy of the show comes from him trying to cover up his complete lack of psychic power with a basic knowledge of massage and rudimentary understanding of Photoshop. And if all else fails, a well-placed punch to the face, a method I both endorse and recommend. Watching Reagan consistently talk himself out of tough situations is entertaining as hell, but I think where he rises above your standard wacky trickster character is in his relationship to Mob. Due to Mob's innocence, he tends to believe every lie and half-truth that Reagan feeds him, and early on it can feel like Reagan's taking advantage of Mob, using his abilities to make money while only paying the little guy 300 yen an hour. But later on in the series, we're shown exactly why Mob looks up to Reagan the way he does, and it's really pretty touching. Mob's other major relationship in the show is the one he shares with his seemingly perfect brother, Ritsu. And at first, it seems like the two have a really good fraternal relationship. And even more than that, Mob looks up to his younger brother a great deal. He's popular, he's good at sports, and he's a member of the student council basically everything Mob wants to be. But as the series goes on, we find out that Ritsu's feelings towards Mob are somewhat more complicated. While he obviously cares for his brother, he also fears him. He grew up terrified of upsetting Mob in any way, for fear that Mob would lose control of his powers like he did in one instance from their childhood. I don't want to say too much about where this plot thread goes, but suffice to say it makes for some of the most compelling character moments in the entire show. The world of Mob Psycho is also worth a mention. While One Punch Man parodies superhero fiction in general, Mob Psycho is much more an acute parody of traditional shonen high school slash Yankee style manga, harkening back to things like Yu Yu Hakusho and JoJo's Part 4. It takes place in contemporary suburban Japan, and while this particular setting has been done to death in anime, it's the very particular and bizarre spin the show takes on it that keeps it feeling fresh and original. There's a constant stream of bizarre little people and subcultures for Mob to encounter. Like in episode 3 when he gets mixed up in the sinister and strange LOL cult. Or in episode 2 when we're introduced to the awesome Body Improvement Club. There's actually a really surprisingly large cast for a 12 episode series, but each new incidental character brings their own quirky and unique flavour. The Body Improvement Club, for example, while being a bunch of buff jocks, also seem really kind hearted and averse to violence, happily accepting Mob into their ranks despite his diminutive stature and encouraging him on his ongoing struggle to get in shape. And there's a lot of little characters like this Dimple, Tomei, Tenga, none of them get an especially high amount of screen time, 
but everything we get from them lets us know exactly who they are and precisely what's important to them. This all gives Mob's world a distinctly light and offbeat, but densely layered feel. It gives the sense that around every corner, some bizarre new little take on contemporary suburban life is waiting to be discovered. It actually reminds me a lot of the Earthbound slash Mother video game series. I couldn't find any mention of it in interviews, but I wouldn't be surprised if one had taken influence from those games. Apart from both being coming-of-age stories featuring psychic powers, both have the same insane twisted take on contemporary suburbia. And this goes a long way in elevating the environments of both series into something beautifully distinct and memorable. Suffice to say, if you enjoy either of these series, then the other is highly likely to appeal to you too. This same offbeat feel also resonates with a lot of the comedy, which is delivered with one's trademark use of misdirection and some really terrific editing. And not only are the jokes good, but a lot of them give us a little more insight into Mob as a character, like right at the end of episode 2, where, for the entire episode, it's been heavily suggested that Mob's going to join the Telepathy Club, only to have him join the Body Improvement Club instead. It's funny, but it also highlights Mob's desire to improve himself rather than rely on his natural abilities. I think one of the main things that helps Mob Psycho's humour so much is the extreme amount of emphasis it places on visual comedy. Which is cool because a lot of anime tends to focus on situational dialogue driven humour instead, which is totally fine, but it does lead to a lot of comedy in anime looking nearly identical, with an overabundance of sweat drops and whatever the hell you call this facial expression. When I say visual comedy, I mean the kind that originated with performers like Buster Keating or the Marx Brothers. Comedy delivered through actions and visuals with very little dialogue. I think The Simpsons at its strongest was exceptional for this kind of humour, but the 90s OVA series Golden Boy is also a total masterclass in it, being a total riot just due to how good a grasp the animators have of drawing humour. And if you want to see the perfect example of this, just go watch the swimming clip from episode 4. It destroys me every time. This same attention to detail is present in Mob Psycho. The visuals are pushed so far for comedic value that the show regularly cracks me up with barely a line of dialogue, such as any scene with Mob working out, or Reagan pulling out one of his signature attacks. This style of comedy is turning into somewhat of a lost art in anime nowadays, and it's encouraging to see a high production show like Mob Psycho lean so heavily into it. As for faults with the show, well, while Mob Psycho is at its heart a shonen parody, there's times when it can lean into it to the point that it starts to feel less like a parody and more like a regular old shonen. Take the Hanazawa arc, for example. We eventually get to this Mob versus Hanazawa battle in which Hanazawa berates and pummels Mob for not letting his powers run wild, demanding that Mob let loose and fight him full force. But Mob refuses, fearing that he may hurt Hanazawa. The battle has some great moments and does a good job of developing both characters, but if you spent any amount of time watching shonen action series, you'll know exactly what's coming here. I could say the same for the setup of the final arc in the series. While it's certainly a good time, especially in its conclusion, it does feel like a very safe shonen style arc, especially in comparison to the rest of the show. Now it does definitely get there, especially in episodes 11 and 12, but there's an episode or two at the beginning where it feels like you've seen it all before. I would also literally kill for more scenes featuring Reagan, but I also respect the restraint shown in using him, as it makes every scene he's in feel that much more special. So with that out of the way, I'd like to talk about the visuals of Mob Psycho 100. And I wanted to leave this part to last because, well, there's a lot to dig into here. I feel every year or so a show or movie comes out that looks distinctly un-anime, something with a completely different visual style than the conventional perception of what anime is supposed to look like. And no matter how well made the series or the talent behind it, there will always be a select but very audible section of the audience screaming that it looks ugly or cheap. And inevitably, this has happened with Mob Psycho 100. I believe that this kind of theory results from judging anime's visuals on a scale of 1 to 10, a 10 being the most typical anime style visual, say something like sword art, and a 1 being the least. The further down the scale you go, the lower perceived quality of the visuals. I'm sure most people who care about anime to the point that they've made it this far into this video do not think like this, and I would bet anyone who does has not been watching anime for very long, nor has much experience with any kind of visual media. 
But nevertheless, I think it's important to point out what a fallacy this kind of thought process is, as it's basically boiling down the medium into a set group of interchangeable templates, which is kind of the exact opposite of what art is meant to be, and is also one of the main reasons a studio like A1 Pictures tend to catch so much flack, as they have very, very similar visual styles for most of their shows, even if those shows look fine in isolation. And to a point I actually understand this way of thinking, it's the idea that every anime should be constantly aesthetically pleasing. The idea that every shot should be pleasant looking, something you could hang on a wall. And when using this logic, you can see why some people would come to the conclusion that Mob Psycho 100 looks bad, as there's a lot of very simple shots with seemingly rudimentary drawing. But the thing is, this aesthetic is a conscious choice. The characters don't look like this from any lack of skill on the animator's part. Just look at how well the hands are drawn in any given shot for proof of that. So why do Bones choose to go with this style? Well, much like One Punch Man that came before it, Mob Psycho is an adaptation of the second of three webcomics from One. But unlike One Punch Man, which was One's webcomic redrawn by the brilliant Yusuke Murata, and then that redrawn manga adapted into anime by Madhouse, Mob Psycho is missing this middle redraw part, meaning that Bones were working straight from One's original webcomic which looks like this. Admittedly, the webcomic is not something you would describe as especially aesthetically pleasing on first viewing. In fact, compared to other mangas, it's downright rudimentary. But I think in viewing it like this, you can miss what's so special about it. While the drawings are simple, one does have a talent for getting across the emotions of his characters. Everything is drawn with this kind of energetic expressiveness that brings his simple sketches to life. I can actually remember one of my old drawing teachers telling me that if you draw something with enough balls, people will believe it even if it's a shitty drawing. And looking at one's artwork, I totally get that from it. He has a way of pushing the gesture and expression of his characters to compensate for any inherent lack of draftsmanship. And if you're finding it hard to see that from the on-screen visuals, then go read a few chapters of any of his webcomics and it should start to make a little more sense. And Bones recognizes this. Rather than adapting one's work into a more conventional anime look, they've instead developed the characters visually to the point where they can animate consistently while stopping short before they'd lose any of one's original charm or expressiveness. And I really have to give them a lot of credit on this. It's such a smart, ballsy visual treatment of the source material and everything from the energetic, expressive animation to the loosely drawn watercolor style backgrounds suits the feel of the webcomic so well. But Bones didn't stop there. They've also found several highly creative ways to push the series to new visual extremes. One of which is through vibrant use of mixed media. Oil painting on glass, chalk, pencil sketches, single level animation, the show constantly switches between different mediums in order to best convey the emotions of its characters. The more intense the emotion, the looser and more abstract the show becomes. It's used to great comedic effect with some highly rendered still shots, but the highlight has to be Mob's explosive 100% sequences, in which the screen becomes awash with surging colors and energetic paint strokes. Not only does it look awesome, but it also creates this great contrast between the show's two distinct visual styles. One being the simple but charming character art of regular scenes, while the other being the intense chaos of the mixed media sections. And this duality in the visuals ties in well to the two sides of Mob. One being the simple child doing his best to keep his emotions under control, and the other being the powerful psychic force ready to let loose at any moment. Another advantage of having such simple character designs is it's extremely low on line mileage, which means that each character can be drawn quickly and easily, and where this becomes an advantage is that the time saved on drawing characters can be used to pose them out in all manner of interesting ways, making for some great expressive animation, even in the very simple scenes. If the show had more complex character designs, this level of detail in the animation would simply not be feasible. Like, let's compare this with the animation from Irregular at Magic High School. Every character in that show has a considerably high amount of line mileage, as they're extremely detailed with intricately designed uniforms and hair. 
And while this makes them look cool, it would also make posing them a total nightmare, requiring a huge amount more work than just directly copying from the model sheets. Which means that most of the non-action shots of the show just involve characters standing straight as a board, with very little expression or gesture in their poses. This again leads back to the idea that if you were to take a still of both shows, it can certainly appear that something like a regular has more visually going on, but seeing both shows in motion tells an entirely different story. This is all without even touching what a treasure trove of Sakuga Mob Psycho is. Sakuga, if you're unaware, is a somewhat bastardized term meaning animation drawing, but has come to represent a particular kind of animation in anime, generally cuts that would require a large amount of work or skill, and is often characterised by sections of fast-paced action, hand-animated backgrounds, or explosive effects work, but can also be much simpler and more subtle too. And I personally would add the caveat that it's any scene where the individual skills of an animator stand out more than the consistent style of a show. This has led to certain animators becoming well known for particular styles of scenes. For example, Toshifumi Akai is particularly good at drawing cute girls feeling strong but subtle emotion. Yo Yoshinori, among other things, is a master of large scale destruction. But the animator I'd really like to talk about here is Mob Psycho 100's character designer and animation director on several episodes, Yoshimichi Kameda. Kameda is a master of fast kinetic fight scenes. His cuts capture so much of the brutal energy and excitement a good combat scene elicits. But what really sets him apart is his ability to capture the brutality of a fight when it has significant emotional weight behind it. One of his most famous scenes being the infamous Roy Mustang vs Envy fight from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, in which Mustang avenging a fallen friend brutalizes the inhuman chimera with searing flame magic. It's an encounter that's been building since early on in the show, and Kameda's disturbingly violent animation does so much to sell the seething hatred Mustang feels towards Envy, to the point that it's actually kind of tough to watch, even if Envy is a total asshole. Kameda's distinctly rough, hard-hitting animation style can be felt throughout Mob Psycho, but possibly one of the best examples of it is in episode 8, which was directed by Kameda, in this sequence where Mob is brutalized by a much older psychic. There's a distinctly unglamorous feel to the violence on display here. It feels much more like a street fight than the typical highly choreographed martial arts fest that we see so often in anime, with Mob nearly entirely unable to defend himself against Koyama. It strikes a harsh contrast with virtually every other scene up until this point, and for the first time we see Mob well and truly harrowingly out of his depth, reminding us that despite his power, he's still just a kid and the animation sells this feeling 100%. It's a brutal and compelling scene, but does serve as the turning point in the story, as it's this fight and its outcome that forces Mob to start being proactive in the narrative, and by extension, to grow up a little. And it's the visuals on display here that communicate this so effectively, as well as making the scene so violently memorable. And to me, this is what I see as Mob Psycho 100's greatest strength. Its ability to look beyond the standard visual treatment of an anime, and to come up with solutions that are all at once beautiful, unexpected, and vastly different from anything else out right now. Whether it be Mob's hopeless expression as he tries to come to terms with the world around him, Reagan's consistently hilarious key poses, or any of the show's stunning Sakuga action sequences. Make no mistake, Mob Psycho 100 is a goddamn gorgeous show to behold. Generally in these videos I'll pick some underlying character trait or theme to conclude on, and it's not like those aren't present in Mob Psycho because they absolutely are, but it's really the visuals I think that deserve to be celebrated here, and how they work in tandem with the story to make it all feel so goddamn special, resulting in something equal parts exciting, hilarious and touching and a show that is hands down my favourite of the year. And this, my dear friends, is why you should watch Mob Psycho 100. Guys, that's going to do it for this video. Thanks again for joining me today, and again, I just want to say thank you for your patience in waiting for these videos. As per usual, you can find me on Twitter at iPatchWolf, or come hang out with me in the boss rush over on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast. 
I will of course be back soon with another video, but in the meantime guys, as always, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.